Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. I'm broadcasting, live streaming from Messiah Lutheran Church in Mechanicsville, Virginia. Joined by Debbie, who will be playing our, our songs for us. We are still figuring things out uh, logistically, but uh, we're glad that we have this technology and this ability to broadcast uh, live and that you all can watch later recorded as well. Um, we're here to worship today and Whatever else has been happening, that hasn't changed. We still have the ability and the directive, the impulse to want to worship God for all the blessings in our life, despite all the challenges that we are still facing. I have a few announcements to share. So uh, this is the last scheduled virtual worship service, virtual only, I should say, worship service uh, that council voted on. The plan is next week to be back together in person. Uh, we will be sending out an email this week with all the details regarding that, but I can tell you that the expectation is, is that everybody will be masked, that uh, we will do all the social distancing, the, all the things we started with when we first came back into the building that we kind of got relaxed on over a while. We want to be back together, but we're going to be the, having those protocols strictly uh, required once more. Uh, that is the plan with regards to offering communion, uh, fellowship time, socializing after worship, uh, keeping that distance, being safe. Uh, the numbers are going down for the Omicron wave. Uh, they're not back to where we wanted them to be yet, but they're getting there pretty quickly. We are monitoring it. So please stay tuned on your emails. Uh, check our website um, for today's bulletin. You can find that if you're on our emailing list, you should have received a copy Friday. And if you're not on our mailing list, please check out our website um, and the digital tab, and uh, you'll find a, a PDF of it there so that you can follow along with worship and songs and prayers and everything. The other plan for next week is that we will install our new council, both returning and new members, uh, during the worship service, and we will have our annual recording meeting, finally, following service, and you can stick around for that as well. Um, and the new council will meet briefly after that to figure out a few things too. And so we will make sure to keep everybody up to date in terms of what to expect in worship, what the requirements are, and how long those will last, what our benchmarks are that we're watching for when we can uh, start again back on the path to everything else. We sent out that worship service, sur our survey last year about getting the choir back and having communion at the altar rail and, and doing all those things. So this has been a little setback, but we're still moving in that direction. Uh, I have one other announcement to share. Uh, we heard from a member that former longtime member Barbara Gaskell's father, Waverly Bug, died. And I wanted to share with you all details about his visitation and service. Visitation will be at Bennett Funeral Home uh, Monday, February 14th from 2 to 4 and then again 6 to 8 with a graveside service the following day, Tuesday the 15th. 3 p.m. at Signal Hill. Uh, if you need more information on that, uh, please call into the church office or email, and we'll repeat that once more. Those are the announcements I have uh, for now. Uh, again, we're all looking forward to getting back together again and doing so safely. And in the meantime, we do this, and it works, and we're thankful for it. We're going to begin with confession and forgiveness. Please take a moment to prepare your hearts and minds for worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates us, redeems us, and calls us by name. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and your beloved children. We have turned our faces away from your glory when it did not appear as we expected. We have rejected your word when it made us confront ourselves. We have failed to show hospitality to those you called us to welcome. Accept our repentance for the things we have done and the things we have left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us and lead us that we may bathe in the glory of your Son born among us and reflect your love for all creation. 
Rejoice in the good news. In Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven. You are descendants of the Most High, adopted into the household of Christ, and inheritors of eternal life. Live as freed and forgiven children of God. Amen. Our gathering song is Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. You'll hear this again in our first reading from Isaiah, something that the angels like to sing. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray together. Most holy God, the earth is filled with your glory, and before you angels and saints stand in awe. Enlarge our vision to see your power at work in the world, and by your grace make us heralds of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading comes from Isaiah chapter 6. Through a vision in the temple, the 8th century prophet Isaiah is called by God to announce judgment against Israel. Aware of his sinfulness and shortcomings, Isaiah is initially hesitant. But when God calls, Isaiah responds, Here am I, send me. A reading from Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, 
Woe is me! I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our second lesson today comes from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Paul delivers, in a nutshell, the story of the gospel that was given to him. In the lineage of the Christian faith, we have received the good news of God's love from generations of believers before us, and we continue to tell this story to the world. A reading from 1 Corinthians. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaimed to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn have received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 5,000 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim and so you have come to believe. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Our gospel reading today comes from the fifth chapter of St. Luke. Jesus' teaching of God's word has begun to draw great crowds. For Simon, James, and John, Jesus' teaching inspires hospitality, then obedience, and then risk. After Jesus' creative power is revealed, fear and amazement leads these three fishermen to leave everything behind to become apostles. The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long but have caught nothing. Yet, if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Uh, for children's sermon today, I don't have a prop, but I know that most of you kids are going to have something 
in about eight days for Valentine's Day. Chances are in your classrooms uh, you have the opportunity to get some Valentine cards, write on them, maybe they'll have some little presents on them, pencils, erasers, candy, I don't know. And you'll be able to put some in a bag or a box for each of your classmates to say Happy Valentine's Day to them. It's a, it's a fun tradition and you get candy or treats from it and you get to share a little love and, and some fun and silly cards. Uh, I was thinking about Valentine's Day, even though it's still eight days away, because of our second lesson today. Because Paul was saying, I received this wonderful thing, this wonderful note, this message of love about Jesus and how much he loved us and, and how he died to save us, how he was raised to save us and, and give us new life. And man, I was not a good person, Paul said. I did bad things. I persecuted the church. I, I yelled at people. I, I was okay when other people were mean to them, when they got hurt. I even encouraged it. I was really bad, but, but God took me and loved me through that and, and took those mean things I did and, and showed me a different way. Showed me how to love. Showed me what Jesus really meant. And so now that I have this love, even though I was so bad, I do everything I can to share it. It's not even me doing it. It's God's love in me just bursting and overflowing to share that love with others. And so he shares it with other people too. And he tells them to share it too. And Paul wrote a ton of letters. That's what we were reading today was one of the letters he wrote to the church there. And he's brimming with love for them and teaching them how to love each other better and not be mean to each other. It's not a Valentine's card, but it's still a love note. And so with every letter he wrote and everything he spoke and did, he was trying to pass on the love he got to others. And so maybe on your Valentine's Day cards, maybe you're not writing a full letter like Paul did, but you're still sharing love. And maybe in the words you say otherwise, and the things you do all the time, you can pass on what you received. Like little hearts that you get handed and then you're passing on. You get another heart and you pass it on. And you get another one and you pass it on. Uh, we just keep getting more love from God. We hear about it in the Bible. And when we come to communion, we get a taste of it. And when we remember our baptisms, we know what it is. And when we get blessings and when we get a chance to help other people, all these things. It's another time we get a heart and we pass it on. So I want you to remember that. Maybe you can make some hearts today. Cut some out of paper, color them, draw them, uh, however you want to do it. Maybe you can make some little hearts and write some notes on them. Uh, not Valentine's, but little love notes about the love that you got that you then passed on. I'm just going to move this right now. It will not stay put. So right here. Let's say you have a drinking glass, right? Just a glass, some water in it. And let's say the water line is about halfway between the top of the glass and the bottom of the glass. Now the saying goes, if you are an optimist, you will look at that glass and say, oh, it's half full. And that if you are a pessimist, you'll look at that glass and say, oh, it's half empty. Your natural off-the-cuff description of the glass of water reveals something about yourself and your outlook on life, half full or half empty, optimist or pessimist. Now, lately, I've seen some new variations on how to describe this glass, various memes, t-shirts, funny things. Um, I've seen that if you are an engineer, you'll say that the glass is twice as big as it needs to be. It's just a design flaw. If you are a realist, you will say that the glass is 50% water, but the other 50% is filled with air, so the glass is 100% full. Come on. If you are a grammar-loving person, you would say that that glass is actually half-filled and therefore sidestep the entire debate. If you are a little bit silly, you might say that the glass is maybe a little bit full, but still has room for dessert. And meanwhile, plenty of other folks have already flagged down the server and ordered something else besides water. Substitute the word nets for the word glass, 
And we arrive at our gospel lesson today. The disciples have just been out all night long, which was a normal time to do the fishing in that time and place. And they have come up empty. A whole night of work. Caught nothing, Simon says. Not just half empty. Nothing. And they are pessimistic. They're tired. They're empty-handed. They're empty-netted. And so they're just cleaning their nets so they can be done for the night. They can go home, try again the next night. Jesus shows up in the midst of this, already with a pressing crowd, and he asks if he can borrow Simon's boat, boat put up from shore a little bit, and he uses it as a floating platform from which to speak and proclaim the word of God to the crowd. When he's done, he tells Simon and company to go back out and to let down their nets in the deep water. And Simon says, pessimistically, um, <laughs> we've been fishing all night, came up with bupkis, but sure, if you say so, Jesus, we'll go put down our nets again. Because the nets were empty. Why should he expect anything different? It's really easy to be pessimistic lately. We're coming up on two years of pandemic, and it can be pretty hard to see any glasses as half full. Everybody's feeling it. Nurses and teachers are hitting their breaking points. Students and parents are tired, speaking from experience there. Everyone's tired in more ways than one. Our country is still polarized. It feels helplessly broken in so many ways. It's so easy. It's pretty much human nature to look at our nets, at our glasses, look at our lives, look at our world, and focus more on what isn't there, what's lacking, what's wanting. You might even look right past your blessings and find yourself muttering used to's and what abouts. You know, things are okay, I guess, but it used to be better. This is fine, but wouldn't it be nice if it was different? What about, we can take a decently full glass, full net, and focus more on the empty parts than the fullness that's there. The fullness that might actually already be in our lives because boy, those, those empty spots loom large, especially after this long, especially lately. This pessimism can be applied to people too, not just situations. Sometimes we see others, even those we love, and focus only on what isn't there. What they could be doing differently, what they could be doing more of, less of, what they could be doing better. And we can turn that pessimism inwardly too, only seeing our own failings and faults, what we could be doing differently, better, more of, less of. Instead of seeing fullness and blessings and and good things and love and, and wonderfulness in our lives, it's so easy to just see our emptiness, our fear, our anger, our exhaustion, our fatigue. What we personally just aren't enough, where we're empty. We miss the fullness that's present. We get overwhelmed with the emptiness and miss the fullness. And whether you are focusing in on emptiness for yourself or for others, that stuff gets toxic pretty quick. It quickly leads to feelings of unworthiness, shame, frustration and anger, and all of that can lead to sin, sadness, both, more. It's all too easy to see glasses, to see nets as half empty, as too little for others and for ourselves. God responds to this. God responds when we speak it. God responds before it even leaves our lips. When Isaiah, overwhelmed that God would call him to do this big job, says, woe is me, I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, from a people of unclean lips. In other words, I am a glass half empty. God responds by filling up the whole room with the hem of God's robe, with smoke, with voice, 
with, with calling between the seraphs, with, with fullness, with proclamation. I will cleanse your mouth and now your guilt will depart from you and your sin will be blotted out, God says. I will take away emptiness and grant fullness and you will tell others about me. You'll tell everybody else about this fullness, the fullness of my designs and my plans and my blessings for you. And when God calls again, who will go? Isaiah says, here am I, send me. Paul says that he is the least of the apostles, as one untimely born, unfit to be called an apostle. He used to persecute the church, an empty and harmful pursuit. How in the heck could he be chosen by God to do anything for the gospel? Who could hear it from him? This persecutor, this broken man, this empty vessel. But Paul knows it isn't him that is doing anything now. It is God's grace that is working in and through him. God has filled him up with salvation, with the story of Jesus' death and resurrection, a message to share, and Paul passes along what he first received to the Corinthians, and he just keeps taking it and passing it. After the huge catch of fish, Simon sounds a lot like Isaiah. He falls at Jesus' knees and cries out, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. I, too, am empty of goodness, to, or at least enough to be in your holy presence and your miracles and your abundance. And what does Jesus do? He says, Hey, all of you, follow me. I'll make you catch people. God responds to our emptiness, whether it's real or imagined, with fullness. God starts the conversation with fullness before we might even say a word. And then commissions us, sends Isaiah out, sends Paul out, sends Simon and the other apostles out to catch people, to proclaim the good news, to share God's message. We might feel like our grace tanks are empty, our nets, our glasses, we're empty. What do we have to give? Why would God want us? We are unfit. We are sinful. We're not enough. To us, God says, I will fill up your tanks. I will grant forgiveness. I will blot out sin. I will give you a purpose. I will give you a message. Fill you up and you can pass it on. When we come up to the altar with empty hands, they're filled with the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, given and shed for us. When we feel empty and hopeless, God fills us with words of scripture, with promises, with camaraderie, with a purpose, with people to serve, with a message to share. When we feel helpless about the world and how polarized our communities are and, and how do we fix this? What do we do with this? And we just give up and say it's an empty pursuit. Why bother? It won't do any good. Jesus shows up reminding us of the golden rule to love others as we want to be loved, to treat others as we want to be treated. Jesus shows up and takes off his robe and puts on a towel and washes our feet and says, go and do likewise. This is what love looks like. This is how people will know you belong to me. When Jesus goes fishing, there is no bait and switch. That is not how God fishes. God says, cast your nets, lower your nets down into these deep waters, and they come up filled to bursting. Let your nets down. Go over there. And like Simon, we might give Jesus, we might give God the side eye. Really? We've been working at this forever. We got nothing. This is pointless. If you say so because we feel like Simon did. We've been fishing all night. We've been working at this, Lord. We've been trying to make this work during the pandemic. We've been trying to make the world a better place, but it just doesn't seem to get better. We're running on fumes. There's nothing good to catch. We know when we're empty. We don't expect there to be anything to catch. Not this time, any more than the other time. God responds with fullness. God says, your nets are full. Just go over there. 
God starts with fullness, initiates with fullness. God ends the day with fullness. God is fullness. Cups overflowing, loaves and fishes multiplying, he heavenly mansions with rooms to spare, feast tables with unlimited seats, arms spread wide on the cross. On and on. God is fullness. And then the curious thing, the unexpected thing, the scandalous thing, is that Jesus, who has all the power of God, all the, the perks and abilities of God, all the fullness of God, it says in Paul's other letter in Philippians in chapter 2, that he did not choose to be equal as God, but instead emptied himself out, even to the point of death, and death on a cross. That's called kenosis, empty. You might have noticed that when the fishermen pulled up their catch from the deep waters that their nets were almost bursting and breaking. And so they pulled in another boat and then both boats were so full they were almost sinking. Our nets, ourselves, our lives are not filled in order just to hold on to it until we sink. We're supposed to give the abundance away, to pour ourselves out. If we try to hold on to it, it'll be too much for us. We are filled to overflowing. We get filled in worship in order to pour ourselves back out. We are given grace in order that that grace might work in and through us and be given away. And then we come back again, hands empty, filled up again. We come back again, remembering. We die every day to sin. We're raised to new life in Christ. We're filled to overflowing so that we can joyfully be emptied again. Because we know that we will get filled up again and again. God will tell us, Jesus will say, lower your nets over here and they will come out full. We have full nets, might not feel that way, seem that way, even today. We have full nets, fullness of violence from God. I do have one little caveat. We do need to drop our nets where directed. We can't just go to any old spot and come out full. We can't go to sin-infested waters that turn us in on ourselves, that make us despair, that make us compare and, with others and keep up with the Joneses and all of that. We don't go to those waters or else we just get fruitless fishing. We go all night and catch nothing. We go to the deep waters that Jesus went to, touching lepers, sitting with sinners, prostitutes, and outcasts, challenging the authorities, the old ways, the set ways, the empty ways. We go into the deep waters proclaiming justice like Jesus did in his hometown over the last couple of readings, the last couple of weeks. We go into service, loving the least of these, we go into the word to find the overall message of God's mercy and grace. We go into the deep waters of fellowship and generosity, even when we think we don't have anything left to give. We go into the deep waters of hope and to promises that are sure. We go into the deep waters that turn us into a living contrast to pessimism, living testimony to God's abundance. And we go out to catch people and share the word. We go to the where we're directed to drop our nets before we have a chance to catch anybody else. Our cups don't have to be either empty or full. I myself am a grammar nerd of sorts, so I won't do the filled thing, but we're gonna go with some INGs here. Our cups, our nets, don't have to be full or empty. They can be emptying, giving ourselves away just like Jesus did passing along to others the grace that we receive. They can be filling, God giving us all we need. It's a process, it's a cycle, emptying, filling, getting filled at the table, giving ourselves away in the world. Whatever the state of our cups, God's cup is always overflowing. There is enough for us to get filled as often as needed. Whatever the state of our nets, God's waters are deep and teeming with life. We go to where directed and drop our nets, they will come up full. Whether we can always see it or not, we have full nets. Thanks be to God.
hymn of the day is called, I think you have come down, there it is. <laughs> Turn my pages, there it is. You have come down to the lake shore. confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance, so we are bold to pray for the Church, the world, and all that God has made. Equip your church to proclaim the good news that we have first received, the forgiveness and grace shown to us through Jesus Christ. Send us out as apostles, sharing the hope of your salvation with a waiting world. God of grace, hear our prayer. 
Holy are you, O God of hosts. Heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Reveal your splendor in fiery sunsets and in deep blue twilights. Teach us to recognize you in the beauty of our natural world. God of grace, hear our prayer. Soften the hearts of rulers and governments that they perceive and tend to the needs of their people. Remove corruption and the impulse toward violence. Protect first responders and military personnel who risk their lives in service of others. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your steadfast love endures forever. Do not abandon those who look to you for hope and healing. Bless doctors, nurses, social workers, therapists, and all caregivers. Draw near to those who are scared, sick, or in pain. We especially lift up this week Debbie, Annette, Bruce with Thanksgiving, Johnny, Adam, Bonnie, Jackie, Ted, Steve and Sue, Karen, Ruth, Ken, Kyle, Dwayne, Griffin, Pam and Woody, family and friends of Roger, the family and friends of Dee, the family and friends of Waverly, Tim, the family and friends of Sandy, Harry, Tyson. We lift up again our veterans, their fellow soldiers, their waiting families, all law enforcement, firefighters, and first responders. We lift up the people and pastor, Reverend Catherine of All Souls Episcopal, and our shared ministry. We pray for all those affected by COVID in all areas of life and for a way forward. Hospitals, nursing homes, other healthcare facilities, the CDC and other medical researchers and scientists, schools, workplaces, government institutions, and municipal agencies. All those impacted by acts of violence at home and abroad, for all who travel, and for all who we now name out loud or in our hearts. God of grace, hear our prayer. The disciples received help from partners as they brought in an abundant catch of fish. So strengthen this congregation's partnerships with community organizations and ministries. Multiply our shared efforts and bring joy to our relationships. God of grace, hear our prayer. We give thanks for our ancestors in faith who boldly answered your call. By their example, give us courage to live in faith and to proclaim your mercy until the day that you gather us into your glory. God of grace, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you have generously blessed us with families. Thank you for your guidance and protection. As you love and care for us, may we also always love and care for our families and keep them in our prayers. We pray this week for the McMillan and Morris families, as well as our Messiah family. May you keep us all from danger and sickness and guard our hearts so that we are reminded of your grace. God of grace, hear our prayer. Since we have such great hope in your promises, O God, we lift these and all of our prayers to you in confidence and faith through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Please share signs of peace with one another this week, today. Uh, drop some comments in the Facebook feed if you're there. If you're on YouTube, I guess you could put a comment there too, or send us a line, drop a note in the mail, make a phone call, a text, whatever you can do. Share some peace with the Messiah folks and anybody else in your life who could use it, which is everybody. At this time, we would normally recognize our offerings. Uh, thank you again for generosity, for uh, consistency, as we once again have been virtual. Uh, if you haven't been dropping off your offerings, we could use them. Uh, it's been a little low the last couple weeks as we've been apart. So if you have the opportunity to drop it in the mail or drop it off at church in the week to come, you can always go electronically through your banks. That would be helpful uh, in the meantime until we are together again next week. Let us pray our offering prayer. Blessed are you, O God, sovereign of the universe. You offer us new beginnings and guide us on our journey. Lead us to your table, nourish us with heavenly food, and prepare us to carry your love to a hungry world. In the name of Christ, our light. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God, who leads you in pathways of righteousness, who rejoices over you, and who calls you by name, bless your going out and your coming in today and forever. Amen. Our sending song is a new one from the new purple All Creation Sings hymnal. It's called Go to the World, and even though the words are new, the tune should be familiar. It's the same tune as For All the Saints, right? Is that what I said? I think so. So, Go to the World. Serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. See you next time.